All right, well, welcome everybody. This is, uh, we're doing it at a slightly different time to, um, to be able to bring in a guest from a different time zone. And the person who's gonna be presenting today is um, Alexis Salier. hope I said that right. He is a uh, developer who's working on a project called Nakamoto, which is a Bitcoin light client written in the Rust language, which is a nice secure language. Um, he's been a developer for quite a long time and he's also working on a project called Radic Radically. You might be radical. It's my pronunciation. Radical, just radical. Got it. Radical. And um, then um, I'll just hand it off to him, and he's going to tell us about his project, Nakamoto. Cool. Thanks, Steve. Uh, yeah. So, um, as uh, Steve said, uh, Nakamoto is a Bitcoin like client written in Rust. And um, what's interesting about it, I guess, the, the, the focus for me on this project was um, creating a client that had very low resource utilization, um, uh, especially for mobile use, um, but also um, a client that was modular enough and also privacy preserving. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those things uh, in more detail. Uh, there's a little snippet of code here about uh, kind of how it, what it looks like to uh, initialize the client and uh, synchronize with the blockchain. Um, if uh, since a lot of the slides are going to be uh, kind of implementation heavy, a lot of code, uh, if you don't know Rust and something looks weird, feel free to ask me. I can explain. But generally, uh, Rust is uh, uh, very similar to C plus plus or Java or uh, or Go even. Um, yeah, so the project has been uh, in the works for a little over six months. Um, I've been working on it in my spare time because I, I have a, another job during the day working on Radical. Um, and uh, it's been a super fun project for me, especially learning uh, the ins and outs of uh, uh, the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer protocol and um, you know the, the, the details on chain selection and... Uh, Things like that that I had a you know a fairly good high level understanding of, but um, when implementing, there's definitely a lot of edge cases and things that you don't think about, and so it was it was a really fun ride. Um, yeah, I have, I have previous experience in distributed systems and, and blockchain technology, but this is my first um, sort of serious Bitcoin project. So um, cool. So uh, Nakamoto is uh, divided in a bunch of crates. So crates are just packages in, in, in Rust. Um, there's a, a client, which is basically the, the entry point if you're going to use the library. Um, there is a peer-to-peer -peer crate that handles all of the, the protocol, peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocol. Uh, there's a chain crate that does uh, chain selection and uh, block storage, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, there's a, a networking crate um, that uh, is the kind of default uh, networking backend, and I'm, I'm going to explain why it's just the default. Um, the common crate is, is common functionality, and then there's a node, which is um, a standalone daemon sort of thing that wraps the client, basically. So uh, if, if you're using this as a library, which is the intended use, you would not use the node, you would just use the client. So. Um, why a new light client? Uh, so why did I build this? I mean, of course I built it uh, to, to learn and, and uh, to um, sort of satisfy my curiosity, but um, there's also a couple of other reasons. Uh, I'm someone who cares a lot about Bitcoin and uh, um, decentralized software. And the, the light client landscape uh, in general, but, but also with, with Bitcoin is sort of I found not in, in a great state and there were mainly two problems I, I saw. One of them was that uh, the, the kind of common uh, implementations of light clients were not privacy pres preserving um, or they had major flaws around that. Um, and the second thing is that mobile uh, wallets are presenting new challenges. So, um, you know, building a, a desktop client is a very different thing than a mobile client when you have to worry about things like better usage and bandwidth usage, uh, you have very different criteria. Um, and so, yeah, looking looking at uh, the, the state of like clients um, 
currently there's a lot of Electrum. Um, so you all know Electrum, I'm sure. Um, but it's basically sort of, it, it's based on, on BIP 37, but it's a custom implementation of a full node. So, um, you know, you have some Electrum, uh, Electrum nodes and some standard Bitcoin full nodes. Um, and uh, BIP 37 was abandoned and basically switched off. Uh, I don't remember when, like a couple of years ago, I think, um, maybe not that long ago, um, because it had uh, several flaws um, uh, concerning privacy um, with, um, I mean, I'm, I don't want to go into details and I also kind of don't remember the exact details, but um, basically it's Bloom filter based and it became really easy to actually uh, corroborate multiple filters and figure out which transactions exactly the the light client was interested in. And so it, it kind of defeated the whole purpose of using Bloom filters and it was basically equivalent. So this is a quote down here that I have from the wiki, um, but basically equivalent to sending your, your wallet uh, addresses to uh, to a full node. So not great. So it was disabled and, um, and um, a small group of people started um, will propose a new, uh, an alternative called Neutrino at the time uh, that event eventually uh, standardized and became BIP 158 uh, or BIP 157 and 8, um, which uh, recently landed into Bitcoin Core. So the 021 release of Bitcoin actually ships full support of, of uh, that BIP. Um, and uh, that's that's really exciting because it, it used to be that it's like, okay, you can, you can build a, a light client uh, with compact block filters, which is what uh, this new protocol is called, but not, no one supports it. So what's the point, right? Um, so now, now uh, Bitcoin supports it officially. Um, and so that's really great. And so it's time for a new generation of, of light clients to emerge, I think. So oh, any questions so far? Okay. So um, if anybody has any questions, sorry, just break in. If anybody, I forgot to mention, if anyone has any questions you don't want to interrupt, go ahead and just put them in the chat window also. Yeah. And I can read them at the end of the QA or or, um, or just break in if, if he has a break. Perfect. Um, yeah, so a couple of considerations when building this. Um, so this this isn't my first sort of networked client library or, or um, software. So. Um, there's a couple of things I had in mind already, and um, but specifically for for light client, there there's there's sort of four areas that I was interested in. One obviously is efficiency um, because of mobile support, right? So um, resource utilization. Um, you want this to be able to run, uh, you know, without draining your your phone battery. Uh, privacy, as I as I talked about, super important, especially these days. Modularity is another one that I think, especially for for a client that. Um, is uh, going to potentially run it in different kinds of environments, different operating systems, uh, different setups or, or situations inside inside wallets. Um, it, it needs to be modular enough that it, it can be useful for more than just the kind of thing I imagined, right? So, um, you know, you could imagine that uh, on, on certain platforms you may want to use a different kind of runtime, or you may not be able to use threads, or you, you may be able to use threads, or you may not have disk storage. Um, so, um, you know, having a, a, modular pro a modular project in this case increases the usefulness of the project, I think. And then finally, correctness, don't get pwned. Um, I kind of uh, include security in this, but basically, yeah, like the code needs to be correct, obviously, and uh, we need to have a way to assert that and to be confident about that when we're, um, you know, handling uh, people's wallets and things like that. So the approach um, I took uh, for these different considerations on efficiency, well, you know, it's pretty basic, like let's try to, to minimize CPU memory and disk footprint. Um, there's a bunch of ways to do this, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not an easy thing. Uh, privacy, as I spoke about, um, BIP uh, 158 support, uh, is, is currently the state of the art. Um, correctness, uh, two things, well, a couple of things, but yeah, trying to minimize the, the dependency footprint um, because the more code there is, the harder it is to have it all be correct, the harder it is to audit it. Um, and I'm gonna talk a bit about testing also. And then in modularity, um, in terms of modularity, 
one of the important design choices I made is to have a, a protocol core that is IO free. So is pure, um, is a pure state machine that does not read or write sockets or anything. And I'll, I'll, I'll dive into that a little bit. And yeah, loose coupling, I mean, that's kind of obvious uh, to, to just kind of keep the, the different uh, areas of uh, functionality separate so that they can be swapped in and out with uh, different implementations. Cool. So I'm kind of going to, I'm going to go through uh, um, the different uh, aspects or different considerations, show a little bit of code that exemplifies the, uh, the approach I took and, and um, yeah, I'm happy to answer questions, you know, after each of them, because some of them are quite in depth or maybe uh, I'm not sure what the crowd is like here, how technical the crowd is. Cool. So first thing is efficiency. So one kind of nice little thing, uh, you know, uh, is that storing block headers and filter headers um, is actually pretty easy because uh, block headers happen to be 80 bytes long each. Um, they're always 80 bytes. Uh, which means um, they're very easy to just store in a flat file. Uh, they're very easy to index because you can just jump, you know, 80 times n uh, bytes from the beginning of the file to to retrieve a block at a certain height or block header sorry, at a certain height. Um, and so uh, it was fairly easy to for me to basically have a, a block storage that essentially didn't waste any space. So like the um, it, it currently for about 670,000 headers, which is more or less the current block height, uh, takes up 51 megabytes, which is really, really efficient because it's basically just the size of the headers. There's no index, there's no uh, um, padding, there's nothing like that. So it's uh, it's really nice. And this this code is basically just the code to, to get a header from that store and to put a header in the store. Um, it's generic because I also use it for filter headers, um, which are just hashes. So these are the BIP158 filter headers. Um, and so, uh, yeah, this this little bit of code was uh, very, very useful. Um, so, so I have a little question. Yeah. So you're not using a database at all then? You're just basically exactly. using like SERTI or something to just serialize this stuff onto the disk file? So it's it's not even SERTI. It's using the, the Bitcoin libraries uh, consensus encode and decode. Ah, interesting. Right, so the okay. the same the same thing that goes on the wire. So you can see, uh, if you can see my mouse, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So consensus encode. So this the trait decodable encodable. This is from the Bitcoin library, uh, the Rust Bitcoin library, which uh, I'm using okay. a lot. I yeah. See. So exactly, no no database. Um, the only thing where I'm kind of uh, uh, where I might need a database is storing filters themselves. So not filter headers, but filters themselves. Um, but so mm -hmm. far, I'm not storing them. And um, if I were, I would probably only store the, the last 1,000 or something like that. That's something I'm still thinking about. OK, um, interesting. But yeah. Um, so next thing on efficiency um, is the networking. So I, I wrote a little library for, for, for networking, which is called Popol, um, which is basically a, a wrap around the poll uh, Linux syscall. Um, which allows you to multiplex across different uh, file descriptors, basically. And um, I, I did this mainly because looking into the available like available runtimes, especially with async REST, um, these had huge dependency footprints. It, it was going to slow the build times a lot. It was going to be very, very heavyweight and kind of dwarf the, the rest of the library in terms of code. Um, and so... Um, I wrote this this little library that that is is really just a weekend project, and it um, allows me to essentially there's there's three kinds of I/O that are interesting uh, to do asynchronously. One is waiting on uh, peer uh, peer events, and so um, so these are these are these guys here. Uh, sorry, just this one actually. Um, so this is any kind of ne network activity with peers. The second one is to have a way to sort of wake up. Um, the process when sending a command, like, uh, oh, you know, when the, the the wallet says, get me a block or disconnect this peer for whatever reason, or, right, send this transaction. So so you have to have a way to, like, um, wake up this event loop. And the third one is timeouts. So timeouts are obviously super important when um, uh, for for doing, you know, ping timeouts and things like that internally. And so this, this 
this is essentially the core of the, the event loop at the moment. I, I stripped out a bunch of code, but um, it, you basically have a call that just waits um, on, uh, on these events. And the whole thing is single threaded so that the entire library is single threaded, which again is, is uh, really nice for efficiency. Cool. Next a question. Uh, so a question yeah. about that too. So is that basically yeah. essentially a replacement for something like Tokyo? Is That's that right. Sort of what That's it's, right. That's okay. exactly right. It's, it's yeah. Stripped strip down yeah. Tokyo. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So it's 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 closer to MIO, which um, uh, Mermal uses. Yeah. It's it's kind okay. of it's very very similar to MIO. It's just a, a simpler version. Yeah. So it's a stripped down, but it's still using the Rust async kind of. No. So actually, oh. actually, I made a decision to uh, early on to not use async. Um, okay. So I'm using uh, uh, threads and channels. And so one of the, the most useful or like important libraries I'm using is called Crossbeam Channel. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, if, if you've used, used Go before, it's, it's very similar. It's modeled on, on Go channels. Um, but okay. yeah, I, I, I found that async actually complicated things a lot. Um, Anyway, we can we can maybe talk about that later. I don't I don't want to. Yeah, no, no, that's good. Just yeah, just uh, understand fork the conversation. The but yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, cool. So um, then jumping onto modularity. So this is this is an interesting one because this is the one I definitely got a bit of I wouldn't say pushback on, but sort of like more like what like questioning about, um, which is uh, okay. So. The, the way the library is currently bid is you have you have modularity at the protocol level, which means that um, the the protocol itself, so the current implementation of the protocol, is behind a trait. It's a very very simple trait. This is the basically the entire trait there called machine, the state machine. It's uh, it's initialized, and then when there is an input to the state machine, um, the step function is called with it with the input, and um, and the outputs are actually passed through an, an internal channel um, to the outside. And this basically allows two things. The, the main thing though, is that um, it's possible to uh, essentially, let's say you wanna, you wanna you know, use Nakamoto, but actually the way it handles um, headers or the way it handles filters is not great. And you wanna have your own implementation of how it handles fil filters, but you still wanna use um, the, the networking and everything else. So then what you do is you implement a new machine. You have um, inside of your machine, you, you have the, the current implementation of the protocol. So you basically wrap the current implementation and you, you, you proxy the request you don't want to handle and you handle the request you do want to handle yourself, right? So it's kind of a way to um, extend uh, the, the protocol or change its behavior um, in a really simple way. Of course, there's other approaches. Like I could have, like I think the like the BTCD uh, suit uh, library in, in Go, it does that with callbacks. So you have a bunch of callbacks that you can, you know, uh, plug your own in, and um, so just different approaches. But since since uh, since I had the separation between I/O and and uh, protocol semantics, this um, this made the most sense. Uh, and yeah, another another nice thing about this is for testing, I can basically um, create a new uh, uh, protocol that's that acts as a, like a full node, for example, to test my light clients with. Um, and then e equally on the other side, the reactor is also uh, based on a trait. So this is the um, the part that handles all the networking. And um, this this is perhaps a more interesting bit for a lot of people, which is that um, you know since there's a separation between the uh, the peer-to-peer -peer protocol logic and the I/O. If you want to implement a, like a multi-threaded uh, networking core or something more efficient or something, um, I don't know, you you want to something based on Tokyo or um, anything like that, it's entirely possible and it's fairly easy because the only thing you need to replace is the reactor, and so the reactor. Um, uh, the, so the event loop I showed previously was what is inside the current default reactor, which is based on pole. Um, but essentially the reactor, um, uh, you spawn it, um, you uh, give it a, a subscriber for events, a channel to receive commands on, 
um, and then you run it and you basically run it with um, uh, essentially the, the, the protocol that you want to run, right? And so this is what I mean by the, the protocol being solvable. So is that you can, you can run this reactor or you can run any reactor with a compatible uh, protocol as long as it implements the machine trait. So if you have your own that um, has some modifications, uh, that's entirely possible to run. This makes sense. So, so just a, yeah, just a mm -hmm. quick question. So when you talk about protocols that could be swapped mm -hmm. in, so like the current protocol is basically the BIP 157, 158. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's not just that, it's also the, for instance, the, um, the way chain sync works, right? Like header synchronization, address, uh, the address book management, um, the, so actually, yeah, one, one. So, so, so it includes the wallet kind of protocols, I guess. Yeah. But like low level, I would say. Um, so it's, it's, um, yeah, the, cause it, cause it's not really a, a wallet library, right. It's more like on the peer to peer side of things, but yeah, the, the, um, um so the blockchain protocol that's right. itself, that's like right. how the blocks tie together, that's right. that sort of thing, exactly. how the transactions are encoded in the blocks, something like that. Exactly, like um, pure handshake also, um, mm -hmm. uh, pings, you know, like ping and pong, like right. that, right. like all Feature of those are, versions exactly, and... yeah. So all of that okay. stuff is, is what's part of the protocol in this case. And yeah, I should have shown a kind of map of the, I actually have one, but it, it um, yeah, I'll, I'll show it at the end maybe to, to make sense of, some of these things. Okay. Yeah, I think I saw that on your GitHub. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, cool. Um, so just an example of how this works in practice. Um, so you, uh, so so the kind of default reactor that I ship is called, is, is under net poll. So it's a poll based reactor. And so here I just kind of create a type with the, with this reactor. And then when I spawn the client, um, I parameterize it with uh, the type that I want. Right, and then it's going to be started with that, um, with that reactor. If you had your own, that was, um, you know, again based on, you know, multi-threaded. For example, you would do type reactor, my own reactor, um, and then client my own reactor. Right, or you could just put it in here, um, and then this will the, the client will essentially spawn the reactor and plug the protocol in and do all of the the plumbing basically. Cool. Actually, quick question there too. So, what yeah. other kind of protocols did you have mm -hmm. in mind that might be usable here? Cause... Yeah, so it's 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 kind of what I said before, where like it's not that like I want people to use this for like uh, Ethereum or something. It's more that um, uh, I needed an easy way to extend the current protocol, right? Oh, for like testing and things like that. Yeah, or like uh, you know, the, if you want to. Um, Again, if, if part of the current implementation is insufficient for whatever reason, or maybe it doesn't do what you want and you don't have the right knobs, right? And you want to kind of go lower level, you would basically just implement your own protocol that wraps the existing one and delegates, right? Delegates almost everything to it, but then it, it could handle, I don't know, maybe a message that I don't handle currently, right? Like the- uh, so, so if I wanted to add like functionality to, uh, I don't know, listen on the mempool or something like that. I exactly. Guess. Exactly, okay. exactly. And there, there, there's probably going to be other ways to extend it in the future, but this kind of was the most straightforward way um, that I could find. Yeah. It was li literally just implementing a, a, a trait. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah, it's a cool. Traits are awesome in Rust. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they work really well. Um, cool. So that's on, on modularity, I think. So then on, on correctness, um, this is kind of the most interesting to me, and this is the one where I, I, I kind of... Uh, um, I had some very specific things in mind because um, I wanted to be able to uh, to test things with uh, what's called discrete event simulation, which is just an, the idea of of sending uh, events to a system, um, and uh, these events can include. So the, the events are, are things like you know message received or client connected, client disconnected, uh, user command or, or, or whatever. Um, but there are also things like, oh, like a certain amount of time passed, right? Um, and uh, and you, what you do is you basically throw all of these events at a client or at a protocol and you see how it behaves, right? Um, and you can even connect multiple instances of this protocol with each other and see how they behave together, right? 
Um, and this is especially useful for consensus-based protocols because you know you can you can start it out as like okay these are these are all peers that have different chain states right different chains and let's see if they kind of reconcile um, and end up with the same tip at the end right um, just by letting them chat to each other um, so this was kind of the approach I wanted to take here and and this is one of the reasons I went with this separation between networking and uh, and protocol state machine, which is that this basically makes it really easy to, um, to run the protocol in memory really, really fast, including having time be fast forwarded. So essentially I could say like, you know, uh, you're, you're, I, I can simulate latency between peers um, without having to wait for that latency to actually happen, right? It can just, it can, the, the simulator can just jump ahead of time um, whenever there's, a, there's latency between two peers. And um, yeah, and the last thing is you can do fuzzing really well because there's you know there's no I/O, so it's very very fast. You can test the vast majority of your logic. The only thing you can't test this way is the reactor itself, so the the, the I/O. Um, but since the I/O is really pushed at the edges, you actually get to test um, you know most of your logic or almost all of your logic. And um, the way this kind of looks, I can again dive into this more if people are interested at the end, but. Um, you know, the, the, the simulation is kind of the, the core type. Um, scheduled is a message that is sent uh, through the simulator. Um, and so the simulation basically has an inbox, which is kind of a shared inbox for everyone, right? Um, it's for everyone because the, the messages basically have a from and a to, right? Like a sender and a receiver peer. Um, the actual input that is being sent. So just to remind everyone, um, the where was, yeah, the, the machine, the step function just takes an input, right? So input represents um, everything that the protocol can consume and act upon. So connect, disconnects, timeouts, messages, um, all kinds of things. So um, the, the simulator basically holds an inbox of all peers. It holds a hash map of latencies between peers, um, uh, an RNG, because we want this to be reproducible, which is another interesting thing about IO free code is that if you get a an error, you can save the seed that trigger that error and sort of play it back until you fix the bug, basically. Uh, so you don't have these flaky tests and things like that. Uh, and yeah, it just holds a timer. That's kind of uh, not that interesting. Uh, yeah. So that's pretty cool. It's, it reminds me of the whole re reactive like Rx Java sort of stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, mailbox, yeah, yeah. Mailboxes and things. It's a <laughs> yeah. reactive sort of stuff. And um, yeah, and so one example of that, I mean, here, here it's not, it's not actually a, a simulation, but it's just to kind of show you the more the the IO free core approach. This is a, a test, and this is basically the entire test that uh, tests the handshake timeout on uh, the, so the version message timeout. So when two peers handshake, if the peer doesn't receive a version message within a certain amount of time, it, it should disconnect the the connecting peer, right? And so here um, we create a peer that is, so, so this, this is a test peer and it basically just wraps the, the core protocol um, with some uh, functionality. Um, and so here we're doing, we're saying, okay, like um, let's, let's pretend that, you know, someone connected to this peer, right? Um, and so the, the peer doesn't know that this is, or the, the protocol doesn't know whether this is a real connection or receives an input that says, someone connected, this is their address, um, this is how they perceive your address, um, and it's, uh, actually, sorry, this, this would be an out-out connection, so it would be, you just connected to, um, to this peer, right? But it could just, it could be an inbound connection too. And then we just say, okay, well, um, let's elapse some time on this peer, and we're going to elapse exactly the amount of time the handshake times out at, right? Um, so this, this, Elapsing doesn't actually trigger any behavior. It's really just saying that time passed, right? So then we we tick, and the tick just says, okay, like now um, do stuff, right? Like figure out what to do. And and what's going to happen here is that the the, the protocol logic is going to be like, okay, let me check, um, you know, all of my my ongoing handshakes, right? And it's going to say like, oh wait a minute, this peer that I just connected to hasn't responded in you know handshake timeout. I should disconnect them, right? And so then what we do here, so upstream is kind of the, the, 
uh, up, like channel of messages that kind of go out of the peer protocol back to the network. And here we're just saying like, okay, let's let's look through the messages that that peer sent out and find one that matches a disconnect message with that peer as the remote, right? And then we just have an expect here so that uh, we basically um, assert that this peer uh, indeed sent a disconnect. And so this is like a really, really easy way to just test protocol behaviors without even needing to spawn uh, um, another peer or without needing to do any IO or anything. Um, and, it, and it kind of falls out of the, the, the design of the, the system or the architecture and the split between IO and uh, um, protocol semantics. Cool. Um, uh, another example, uh, well, not an example of this, but another kind of um, interesting way of testing certain things. Uh, it's called model checking or model testing. And this is kind of useful when you have a very complex system that is uh, that can be simplified in a naive way um, such that it will potentially perform really poorly, but it will be trivially correct, right? So um, in, in this case, chain selection is, is a perfect candidate. So chain selection is, is, um, is something that is, can be explained really, really simply, right? You can say, well, you know, you look at all the chains that you have, or, or the, you look at the, the block tree that you have essentially, and you pick the, the tip or the, the chain with the most work, right? That's really easy to explain, right? Um, but then if you try to implement that efficiently, it's actually really, really complicated because um, it's just like not a, it's, it's not a, a problem that, that can easily be solved in, uh, linearly. You have to, um, you know, keep, keep track of a lot of chains that are sort of incomplete potentially, or, you know, you receive, you see, receive like orphan blocks that they don't have a parent. So you just kind of have to keep them around. And every time you get a, a block, you have to check if it, if it is the parent of any of your orphans. So you have, you have a lot of kind of, um, sort of hairy logic, uh, to, to make this efficient, but if you don't care about efficiency, you can just say like, oh, every time I get a block, I check everything and I check, the, I check all possible chains that can be constructed. Um, and I get the longest, right? And so what we can do with model checking is we can basically run a bunch of test cases on both the, the, real, um, the real optimized implementation, which is very complex, and the model, which is very, very simple, right? It doesn't need testing almost because it's so simple. Um, and then we just check that the, the result is the same. So that the, right, so, so we create a, a real store, we create a, a model, we import a bunch of blocks in both of them, so the same thing, and then we check that they've they've come to the same tip or the same chain in the end, right? And this is a, a property check, so this is a quick check, which means um, the, the the generator is going to run this function with like you know hundreds or thousands of different trees, block trees, um, to to test all edge cases essentially. And this is really really effective at finding. Uh, uh, yeah, at finding edge cases, basically. Um, and then, you you know, when you have an error, you, you can see that the model came out, came at a different result to the, the, the real um, cache or the real chain. Um, and you can decide, you know, maybe you have a bug in the model, it happens at the beginning, but eventually you're going to have, you know, your model will be, will be working really well and, and you're going to discover bugs in the, in the real implementation, in the optimized implementation. Is this a little bit like fuzzing in a way that you're throwing yeah. a lot of different inputs at it? Exactly. It's it's a way of of using fuzzing actually because um, essentially this this could be uh, fuzzed right where the input here would be the the fuzzer providing the fuzzer would be providing the input um, and then you would you would use that to generate um, lots of different uh, headers or, or or yeah input headers or, or block trees um, and then get uh, testing the uh, stores according to that. And actually, yeah, I, I've been wanting to use uh, fuzzers for this kind of thing. Right now, I just use quick check, which is kind of, a, it's not a fuzzer. It's it's a cousin of a fuzzer, I would say. Um, yeah. 
is this another place where you use your model or your uh, sort of where you can put in two different models under the same framework, like your simple one and your actual? Yeah, one? yeah, exactly. So the um, that's exactly it. So so here it, it's not really um, showcased because we don't we don't use these caches uh, anywhere. We just kind of test against them. But yeah, the 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 block cache uh, has a um, implements um, a trait called, called block tree. And yeah, if you wanted to use something backed by, um, I don't know, like a different database, for example, because the file one uh, that I made is is not performant enough or something like that, you could easily do that. Um, and it also means that uh, for the um, the protocol test, also test the peers with a different uh, a different backend, basically. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, okay, let's keep going. We're almost almost done. Um, yeah, I guess this is kind of last the last thing um, in terms of correctness. So I talked a bit about dependencies. Um, I'm kind of a um, dependency. Um, I don't know what, what to call it, but um, <laughs> I'm I'm very uh, very um, strict with sort of my dependency budget. Um, for me, it's it's. A big part of it is just due to, to build times with Rust um, because I like to have a very, very fast, uh, I like my tests run really fast and I like to have a fast iteration cycle. And so I don't, I don't really don't like when things, when I have to wait on, on builds. So that's kind of a more personal reason. But um, I also think that for things like, uh, like Bitcoin, um, having too many dependencies is a problem because you kind of either have to trust them, which is never a good thing. It's not something we want to do. Um, or you have to audit them, which is uh, an insane amount of work. Um, if, you, if you think about something like Tokyo, which uh, Steve brought up, that, that has something like 40 or 50 transitive dependencies on its own. Um, so I would hate to, to have to, to go through that, for instance. So yeah, I mean, Less code equals less bugs. I think everyone knows this. Um, and uh, and and one other thing to can other other things to consider is it's not just about um, the amount of code. Is also that um, if you have third party dependencies, these are things that change hands. You know, maintainers move on. They 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 pass their crates on to other people. Um, and and it's been uh, this has been exploited many many times, where uh, someone will take over a crate, um, insert a backdoor. You know, everyone upgrades because their their uh, their version bounds are not strict enough, or you know, whatever. And then now their their library is backdoored, right? So this is something we have to be really uh, careful about uh, with crypto, especially. So so Nakamoto is, is very very lightweight in terms of dependencies. Part of it is, or like that part part of it is thanks to not using async, because for for whatever reason, async in Rust is. Uh, um, like a dependency hog, like it, it's 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 crazy, but part of it is just kind of being a little bit careful with what I pull in. Um, I would say that um, you know these four crates are the ones that I use extensively and that I would not be able to replace with anything else. So of course the Bitcoin crate, um, Bitcoin hashes, cross beam channels, basically all the communication between the user thread and the the, the protocol. And then this is just a crate to do nice, to, to handle errors um, and error messages and all that stuff. Um, logging, non-empty is one of my crates. It's just a, a vector, uh, non-empty vector, lazy stat static. Uh, I think everyone knows it if you know Rust. This is random numbers. And this is um, uh, sort of, it's uh, JSON, which I use for storing uh, peer, uh, peer data. Um, and then there's a bunch of transitive dependencies. So these are kind of coming out of these. Nothing too crazy, and then on the uh, the networking library, it's very very light. It's Popal, which is a library I, I I wrote Socket two, which is just a, so a better socket library, and uh, Libc. So it's some one of the things I'm most proud of is managing to uh, <laughs> wait. What did I just do? Managing to uh, keep the dependencies tight. Um, yeah, and so finally, what's next? Um, so more complete BIP 158 support. So currently, um, BIP 158 um, doesn't uh, handle the case where uh, there's a malicious peer which is, you know, sending 
um, incorrect filter headers. So this is something I'm working on. It's not easy, um, but um, I'm, you know, it's it's something I'm working on. So basically, you know, uh, corroborating and, and like checking the uh, headers sent by multiple peers. And then um, if they disagree, uh, fetching the blocks and then checking it, checking them manually and then banning the peers that don't uh, like in invalid headers. So it's that whole thing um, is fairly complex and that's kind of the thing I'm working on now. Um, a CFFI because I want uh, Nakamoto to be really easy to embed in, in you know, with Swift or um, Android and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, Multi-peer IBD, although to be honest, it currently can sync in like less than a minute with a single peer. Um, so this is kind of not a, a number one priority right now, but it, but it would be nice. Um, transaction, transaction monitoring, because there's, I basically don't do anything with transactions at the moment. And yeah, a lot more testing. And a lot of these are, are on GitHub. So if, if anyone was interested in, in contributing, uh, I'd be very happy to uh, kind of show you the way. Um, but there's already a bunch of issues I've created uh, around these uh, that um, I need help with. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, wondering, thank you. I was wondering a little bit more about your C plus, your FFI yeah. approach. What was your sort of thinking there? I know that that's a common way for uh, doing language binding to Rust. Mm -hmm. um, is that something you're just, you haven't started yet, you're just sort of thinking about, or if you had a yeah, concept cause, cause on that? Exactly, because there's there seems to be like two approaches at the moment. Like one of them is kind of to say like, okay, I'm gonna I'm going to support like the Android, um, you know, I don't remember what it's called, the J, JDK thing, you know, direct bindings to Java, um, and then I'm going to support um, Swift and to kind of create um, libraries around uh, around those platforms specifically, right? And that's definitely a good approach if uh, if you're targeting specific platforms. The other approach, which I'm kind of more interested in at the moment, is to just say, okay, like, can we have general bindings that would allow, for example, Python code to use Nakamoto or Go code or you know whatever, and and to do that, yeah, you you just need generic C bindings. Um, the problem is, uh, you know, you don't want to um, like it can be a lot of work. You don't want to uh, expose everything to C because that's just gonna it's just too much. So um, what I'm thinking right now is kind of figuring out what is the API surface that I want uh, a CFFI for. Um, and it's probably going to be the client because that's kind of the, the you know main entry point, um, and that's probably where I'm going to start. But yeah, I haven't I haven't done any work on that yet. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, sort of have a potentially have a public API that you expose for uh, exactly language exactly. binding purposes. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Well, thanks. Sorry, I stepped on your last slide a little bit, but thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk. And if you want to take a few questions, if anybody has any questions, um, you can either you can either unmute yourself and ask, or if you'd like to, I'd rather just put it in the chat window. I'm happy to read anybody's questions that you want to post there. I know that. So, just uh, yeah. our, our group isn't necessarily all that technical, but there might be some technical <laughs> folks that have some questions. Yeah, I realize this was. Uh, uh... Uh, it's uh, yeah. Any questions? I I, I thought it was yeah. I, I'm definitely interested in this stuff, so I thought it was very interesting. Very, you've got a very well thought out architecture. It sounds like for how to put these things together and test them, which is of course the really really hard parts. So, yeah, yeah. You, your questions were great. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Well, we just got somebody who joined. Um, I, I can ask you a question here. Um, so what's the uh, what's the path to like this getting into somebody's hands to use or, or mm -hmm. like getting wrapped into an an Android app or like mm -hmm. um, what is that path? Where, where does where's the user come into contact with this? Yeah, so um, yeah, that's basically basically through the client. So that um, I'm going to just go back here because this is kind of the uh, the the way a developer would um, interact with this. Um, a developer who's implementing a, a wallet, right? So um, you would basically uh, spawn a client. Um, and then the, the important thing here is basically you have this, this handle, which is a way of communicating with the client that is spawned and that is connected to the peer-to-peer -peer network. 
So now if you were implementing a wallet library or a wallet uh, you know, app, um, you would basically ho hold on to this handle. Um, and um, whenever the user submitted a transaction or whenever um, you wanted to, uh, to you know, check the current state of the chain or the current state of the, uh, the user's transactions, you would use this handle. Um, and so, okay, this is a bit, bit on the low level side. In terms of integrations, um, I'm talking to a couple of people, especially the BWT uh, folks, um, Bitcoin Wallet Tracker. They're interested in integrating um, uh, Nakamoto and also of actually providing a um, an Electrum front end to Nakamoto, which is kind of interesting. Which means that if your wallet um, is currently talk, uh, able to talk to Electrum you would be able to swap that out with Nakamoto, right? So that you wouldn't have to change the way uh, it works, but you would have sort of gain the, the privacy and uh, wider network support um, out of the box. Um, but yeah, like the, basically this, this lives under, to, to put it simply, this lives inside of uh, a wallet library or wallet software. Basically it's, it would be embedded in uh, one of those so, for example, Steve's uh, um, Bitcoin Dev Kit um, could integrate with this, um, and so could uh, any other library, any, any other wallet library. Sorry. All right. Cool. Another um, another one I've been talking to is uh, Bisc. Um, I don't know if you know Bisc. It's like a peer to peer Bitcoin exchange. Bisc is um, yeah, so they use they use Bitcoin J right now, um, and yeah, Bitcoin J is uh, as as I said, it is one. I mean, it's one of the best like client libraries uh, around, but it's uh, you know built around the Bip thirty seven still, um, and I don't think it's ever gonna be updated. So so they like the the Bisc crew have been looking into uh, alternatives that they can use to you know get around these sort of issues uh, and. Uh, they, we've we've chatted briefly. I don't think they have the resources right now to to um, implement that Komodo or to integrate it. But um, that would be an example. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, so it's basically a library that other projects can can pull in and get the get the feature, the functionality of this light client. Yeah, uh, communication to the blockchains to the Bitcoin yeah. blockchain. Nice. Yeah, because uh, the the peer to peer the peer to peer stuff is often the thing people don't want to bother with, right? It's like, okay, I have this wallet and it handles everything, but uh, I don't want to talk to the peer to peer network. Is like it's really complicated. I'm just going to talk to an Electrum server, you know? Um, and that's 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 why like most wallets, like even even new one like Blue Wallet, uh, which is a great a great one, a great wallet, um, is Electrum based, you know? And and it makes sense because it's like, okay, how what's the quickest way I can build a wallet? Well, I will, you know, spin up an Electrum node. Um, but uh, yeah, so I've done some of that hard work. <laughs> so hopefully uh, um, people can benefit from it. Yeah, definitely, that yeah, looks like some nice, nice reusable code yeah. for that, 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 oh, that, that, that aspect of a wallet. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, so if it wouldn't be BISC, then who would be your ideal client that you would look mm -hmm. to? Um, yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, BISC, BISC would be ideal because um, mm -hmm. it's a great project, but mm -hmm. I'm, uh, you know, um, I'm looking at client like uh, Blue Wallet as another one, uh -huh. BRD or Bread um, is another really nice wallet that is BIP37 based. Mm -hmm. um, so they have their own custom C implementation, I think, uh, of uh, <laughs> the peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Um, uh, Wasabi Wallet, um, I think they have a custom one. They might actually have BIP158. I'm not sure what, what is their backend, but if not, then I would love to integrate with them. Um, and then I have no clue about Android because I'm an iPhone user, but uh, I think Mycelium is a really nice wallet. I don't know what, I have no clue again what they uh, what they use in the backend, but if it's not privacy preserving, then it should be. Um, yeah. Yeah, so there's 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 a bunch of them, and then there's like as I said, you know, like like BDK is is a is a good example of this sort of um, a library that stands or that sits sort of between a user or like end user wallet and something like Nakamoto, 
Mm-hmm. So um, that would be a nice integration. I think someone has brought it up already um, on there um, because then then anyone who uses BDK could sort of uh, choose to use Nakamoto as their backend. Um, so that would be kind of cool. Um, yeah. I see. Thank you. That's very interesting. Yeah, I think yeah, I, I'm you know involved with the BDK project. And I agree. This would be we we currently have a, a light client implementation, but uh, the way the wallet is set up, you can certainly have different block providers, yeah. and it'd be it'd be it'd be nice to have you know multiple implementations if if there's interest in you know people want to want to plug in Nakamoto as a light client uh, block provider. That would be a, a really yeah, it'd be interesting. Yeah, feature, yeah I, I looked project. at your your bit implementation, and it's it's really good. Um, I think um, the one thing though is that it was is BDK like um, uh, like how does it how does it connect to the peer to peer network? Yeah, I mean, so it's 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 using so it has multiple blockchain backends. Mm-hmm. It can you know talk to Electrum or it can talk to Explora, um, right, right, or it right, can right. use yeah. the Bit One Fifty Seven stuff. It's 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 a little more heavyweight possibly than what you have right. here because it's yeah. using. Yeah. you know, a, a normal data, you know, sort of a heavy database. And yeah. it's also using, um, you know, uh, a, you know, async kind of standard async yeah, yeah, library yeah. stuff. So, um, but, you know, I think it's definitely interesting to, to, to look at, to look at all the options and yeah. see how that could, could, we could build on top of something like what you've built to be, yeah. be a nice integration, I think. Yeah. There's so much work to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's always the case. I mean, yeah, it never ends. But yeah, the goals I think are very similar, which is to provide yeah, yeah. A, you know a standard, well-tested implementation that people can just plug into a wallet. So exactly. Back to Kristen's yeah, Kristen's question is just that you know the idea here is just to have some nice open-source libraries that are well-tested and well-used that right. can be plugged in, and just just to make wallets easier to build yeah. and safer to build. So yeah, it, I mean it's it's, it's, yeah. okay. it's it's crazy how um, you know how, how this doesn't exist yet. Like how all these wallets have had to to build this by hand, like custom every time. Um, yeah. It's uh, yeah, it's no wonder that you know, there's there's not enough good Bitcoin wallets out there. Yeah, and like I think, like you said too, a lot of wallets just kind of take the easy route and yeah. use yeah. Uh, use a, a yeah. protocol like Electrum, which is nice. It's fully functional and all, but it. Yeah. It's not. Uh, it's not very. It's not really privacy protecting at all, unless you're just connected to your own server, and that means you have to set up your own server, which is exactly. not very friendly to, to folks who don't want to do that kind of system administration work. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, now just you know related to your project too, the fact that um, Bitcoin D version zero twenty one is out now, which actually means it supports these these protocol. You yeah. know, it supports this particular protocol that Nakamoto is is supporting. Uh, the Bitcoin D seven one fifty eight stuff. So have you have you had a chance to test it directly with the full node? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's okay. it, it works cool. great. Um, there's not that many nodes out there. Um, yeah. I I end up spinning uh, spinning up my own. Um, so I have a node running now with with Bit one five eight. But um, yeah. the last time I, I connected to mainnet, I think I, uh, it, yeah, I discovered about three nodes, and and um, <laughs> so it's like a few weeks ago, yeah. like. Is, you know, it, it, it'll it'll only grow. I think a year from now, I yeah. think it's going to be fairly well adopted. Yeah, yeah. I think I think you're right. It's definitely the it's a great direction. And I think as you said before too, especially for people running mobile clients, wallet, uh, live uh, exactly. phones and things, it's going to yeah, be and, a you know, nice protocol to support. And the thing is, phones are so much more secure um, as wallets than laptops or desktops. I think. Uh, like we're we're just gonna see more and more wallets uh, on the phone, and desktop is gonna be less of a thing, I think. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think I think in certain parts of the world that's already the case. So that's yeah, true. Not a yeah, not a surprising trend. So yeah. okay, well, great. Have anybody have any other just last questions before we let uh, let Alexis go? No. Okay, well, thanks again, Alexis. This was a really interesting talk. Appreciate appreciate you. Thanks for having me. It was fun.